Hello, and welcome to this tutorial on fibre optic hydrophones. We'll begin by reminding ourselves what we mean by hydrophone. This is a device designed with the sole intent of receiving ultrasonic signals underwater. Throughout this tutorial, we'll talk extensively about fibre optic hydrophones, and we commonly abbreviate this FOH. Fibre optic sensors tend to fall into two broad categories. Those with intrinsic sensing mechanisms, where the sensor is built into the body of the fibre, and extrinsic sensors, which are located on the tip or the end of the optical fibre. The two most common forms of intrinsic sensor are fibre brag gratings and interferometric sensing. And whilst intrinsic sensors are very commonly used in structural health monitoring, in civil engineering structures or aircraft structures, they often return a signal which is a line integral of the acoustic phenomena they experience. As such, this is less used in ultrasonic metrology because we're more interested in point-to-point -point measurement. So for the duration of this tutorial, I will not be talking about intrinsic sensors. Extrinsic sensors similarly split into two categories, interferometric sensors and reflectance-based sensors. And you find that interferometric sensors could have a polymer spacer or hard dielectric spacer and potentially hard dielectric mirrors. We're often faced with the question, why use a fiber optic hydrophone? Well, size is one of the first considerations. If we look at the typical optical fiber shown here, the cladding diameter for a single mode fiber is of the order of about 125 microns. It's the external diameter of the fiber, of the cladding diameter, which is likely to influence its diffracted radial resonance response. And therefore, a very small sensor means not only do you have a small scattering cross section, but also these resonances are pushed to very high frequencies. If we look at the core of a single mode fiber, this is typically of the order of nine microns. Now it's the core that determines the optically illuminated area and in turn determines the active element of the sensor. This means we can have very broad directivity, very low spatial averaging sensors. Another important consideration with fiber optic hydrophones is their immunity to EMI. Consider a piezoelectric hydrophone shown here. We have a sensing element, which is connected electrically, probably via some form of transmission line, back to a sensing circuitry. In the presence of electromagnetic noise, even with very good grounding, will be some of the noise makes its way back to the received circuitry. In high noise amplitudes, this can lead to a very noisy signal. In contrast, if we look at a fiber optic hydrophone, it's made entirely of non-conductive components, typically fused silica and polymers, and therefore there's no conduction mechanism to get back to the receiving circuitry. This is particularly useful when we're measuring continuous wave ultrasound fields, where there's high levels of leakage of signal from the front face of the transducer. With continuous waves, there's no way to temporarily separate the acoustic from the electromagnetic signature. But fortunately, with an FOH, this ceases to be a problem. Let's look now in detail at the optical interferometry, which allows us to make fiber optic hydrophones. We'll start by considering a polymer spacer layer. The first step is where we have a partial mirror deposited on the tip of a optical fiber. There'll be some reflection of light from this. That light which is transmitted will then pass through a spacer layer until it reaches a full mirror where there'll be reflection. There'll be some multiple reflections in this cavity because the partial mirror will partially reflect some of the transmission and partially reflect it back again. And this gives rise to an interferometer transfer function shown here as a function of optical wavelength. By tuning the laser to the spacer cavity, we determine an operating point. 
When an ultrasound wave encounters the fiber optic sensor, it compresses the spacing cavity. And we can see that we get some movement of light intensity as a function of wavelength up and down the interferometer transfer function. Because as we can see, there is some partial cancellation due to destructive interference effects of the two different reflected light signals. We can undertake a similar idea if we look at a stack of quarter wave layers that form a hard dielectric mirror. We could then put a half wave spacer layer in to again form an interferometer and another stack of hard dielectric mirrors on the outer surface. This is still an interferometer, but this time it's constructed entirely out of much more rigid components. In fact, if we look at the dynamic range and sensitivity of these two interferometric sensors, we could start by looking at the polymer sensor. Recall that there was an almost straight section of the interferometer transfer function. That's shown here with the dotted line indicating our linear range. At the bottom end of that, we have our lowest sensible sensing pressure. This is our noise equivalent pressure. Similarly, the upper limit of that linear dynamic range is shown here, which is where we start to see a deviation of the sensor output from the linear relationship between output and pressure input. Considering now a hard dielectric, this is a much stiffer material. So we notice there's a much changed gradient relative to the polymer spacer. However, because it's a stiffer material, it also requires greater pressure before you can start to get some signal. So in this case, the noise equivalent pressure has increased. But so too has the maximum measurable pressure. In summary then, you find that polymer spacers have got a higher sensitivity with lower noise equivalent pressure, but lower maximum measurable pressure. Both noise equivalent pressure and maximum measurable pressure are increased when you've got an interferometer incorporating hard dielectric components. Let's now also look at the Fresnel reflectance type of hydrophone. Because the hydrophone is immersed in a fluid, typically water, there'll be some reflectance due to the change of refractive index between water and the structure of the fiber, typically fused silica. When an acoustic wave is incident upon the fiber, there will be localized rare refractions and compressions of the water. And this will lead to locally very small changes in the refractive index of water, which in turn modulates the amount of light reflected. It's worth bearing in mind here that the change of refractive index with pressure is very small. So Fresnel reflectance hydrophones tend to have a very low sensitivity. However, because they incorporate no other components other than just a fused silica fiber, they have nothing which can go non-linear in their response function, so it can be used to measure very high pressures indeed. Thus far, we've alluded to the measurement of CW fields and high amplitude fields. This is a combination which often leads to cavitation, and therefore it's important to consider how a fiber optic hydrophone would respond in a damaging field. We'll begin by looking at reflectance hydrophones. If we have an expanding bubble, which eventually collapses and undergoes inertial cavitation, cavitation is a highly damaging event, and it's almost certainly going to lead to damage to the hydrophone tip. Even if the damage is outside of the core area, changes to the cladding still affect the optical field and therefore to the sensing. One of the advantages of a reflectance-based hydrophone is the ability to introduce a blade edge cleaver, which can produce a cleave line. The cleaved tip can then be removed away and we have a fresh sensing element. This can be conducted by the user. In contrast, if an interferometric sensor undergoes cavitation damage, there's very little that the user can do to repair this. Unfortunately, 
the sensor needs to be replaced. However, the one mitigating factor is that the cost of optical fiber hydrophones is approximately one tenth of that of piezoelectric hydrophones. So whilst they're not a disposable option, they dramatically reduce the cost of replacement. One of the other advantages of a fiber optic hydrophone is thermal sensing. I'll use here a polymer spacer interferometer hydrophone as an example. Other hydrophones have thermal sensing in slightly different ways. If there are thermally induced changes that the hydrophone experience, the polymer spacer cavity will expand. We've already discussed that the expansion and contraction of the spacer cavity is the mechanism that allows us to determine ultrasonic signals by looking at the change of the reflected light. Therefore, we in principle have a means of determining thermal response as well. The big advantage is that thermal events occur on a time scale of seconds, whereas ultrasonic events occur on a time scale of microseconds. So by separating in time, or conversely, in frequency, which expansions correspond to thermal and ultrasonic events, we have a dual sensing mechanism. This is particularly useful when we're looking at therapeutic ultrasonic fields, because we can look at both the applied acoustic field and the ultrasonically induced heating that arises from it. So in summary then, we've seen that all fiber optic hydrophones are small, and immune to EM noise. Some can measure thermal change as well. Interferometric fiber optic hydrophones have a high sensitivity, but are not user repairable. Reflectance based fiber optic hydrophones have a much lower sensitivity, but they can be recleaved by the user should damage occur. We hope you found this interesting. If you have, please come back and find some more of the Precision Acoustics tutorials.